Well, we are returning to Abraham and Sarah after like five weeks. Yes, it took five weeks or so just to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And now we're going back and we're going to reintroduce ourselves to Abraham and Sarah. Now, when we left Abraham and Sarah, there had been a promise, of course, of a son. Now, Abraham already had a son. That son's name was Ishmael, but it wasn't the son of promise. It wasn't the son that God had promised Abraham and Sarah. The specific promise was found in Genesis chapter 15, and I want to read you some verses just as a reminder. In Genesis chapter 15, it, it reads this, starting in verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Now, remember, before uh, God had changed his name from Abram to Abraham. So this vision from the Lord came to Abram in a vision, and it said, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my state is Eliezer to Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. And then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So remember that Abram and, Abram and Sarai had left their home. And Hebrews chapter 11 tells us about it was done by faith. He was trusting God and he was trusting God at God's word. And so they left. And that was in, that was in Genesis chapter 12 where God, again, in, in a little more veiled language, had told Abram that he was going to be the father of many nations. And yet he had no children. And at the time of that first promise in Genesis 12, Abram was 75 years old. Now, I don't know about you, but there aren't many 75-year-old men married to 65-year-old women that when someone says you're going to have a promise of a son, that you'd start looking around saying, okay, um, right. But that was God's promise. That was God's promise, Abraham. In Genesis 16, we came across Sarai's lack of faith. Even though God had promised them a son, Sarai wanted a son desperately. And so in chapter 16, she says this. The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Think about that. Although God had promised Abram a son, and I'm sure he shared that with his wife because, you know, it takes two to dance, so to speak. She was so frustrated that she bypassed that promise from God and actually talked Abram into sleeping with their slave woman, Hagar. And he did. And Hagar gets pregnant. And sure enough, they have a son, Ishmael. But that caused problems. Hagar's Son, Ishmael, the, the word name means God hears. And so in verse chapter 17, they have the covenant of circumcision. And so then Ishmael is circumcised, which brings him into the covenant. And in chapter 17, verses 15 through 17, again, God gives a promise. God also said to Abraham, by, as for Sarah, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarah. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. That was not Ishmael. That was not Ishmael. 
that was this promised son that had not come. So then this takes us right to where we left off a number of weeks ago. You remember the, the visitors come and Abraham is very hospitable and provides, provides food and such. They were on their way, of course, to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And it was there again that the visitors said, in a year from now, Sarah is going to have a son. And so the, here, the idea here, and our title of our message is God's promises, a son, God's promises fulfilled. Here we have the idea here is the idea of a son being promised, and yet out of the frustration of, particularly expressed by, by Sarah, she has Abraham sleep with the slave, and they raise a son, but the point, and you'll see this come clearly, the point is that although Ishmael was a son of Abraham. He was a son of flesh. He was not the son of faith. And this is key. This is key for us to understanding this particular chapter. Because you'll see as we close, this chapter is far more than just the idea of somehow a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman having a son because God promised and that son's name is, is Isaac. That in itself is an extraordinary story. But what you're going to see in this story is that every one of us, every one of us here who claims to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ is a son or a daughter of Abraham by faith. This passage, this story sets in place, sets in place, the idea of the promise of God to Abraham in a son named Isaac, a son of faith. And the separation between the idea of faith in God versus the idea of works in God. Before we look any further, let's, let's ask God to bless this time as we look into his word. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the word of God. Particularly, Lord, this story, as we return to Abraham and Sarah and the birth of Isaac. Lord, face value, in and of itself, it's a, it's a, it's a great story. It's a, it's a great event. How, Lord, by your grace and mercy, uh, uh, permitted an old man and an old woman to experience the birth of their own child, a child of faith. And yet, Lord, as we see here, as we'll look into your word, Lord, this is far more than just that story. This is a story, Lord, that impacts everyone here today that knows and loves Jesus. That although we couldn't claim for most of us any connection of our descendants going back into the Jewish realm, and yet, Father, we are indeed sons and daughters of Abraham because of your son, Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds to the truth of your word. And I pray, Father, that you would provide clarity as I, as I preach this, as I explain this. I pray, Lord, that you would clear up anything that I, I, I might misspeak and that you would work in our hearts to rejoice in what you have done through your son, Isaac. And that we, Lord, would commit ourselves by faith to know you and to love you. But we also pray that, Lord, there may be some people here who love the idea of their religion, who love the idea of going through the motions and doing all the religious things that just make them feel good. But I would pray, Lord, that they would see those things for what they really are, works. And Father, without faith, Lord, there's no forgiveness of sins. And they would see that their works, Lord, are not faith. And that they would come to faith in Christ even today. And so we thank you for that, Lord, and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You might have seen that we are skipping a number of events to get right to the birth of Isaac. Uh, 
And as we look at these things, we need to understand a couple bases. Only children of Abraham are sons and daughters of God. And you might say, okay, well, how does it work? Well, it works because children of Abraham are those who know and love Jesus Christ as their Savior. You know, there are all these people who claim to be descendants of Abraham. You have all the Jews. All the Jews are descendants of Abraham. You have Muslims who are the descendants of Abraham. You have Ishmael, who is a descendant of Abraham. But that doesn't mean that they're sons and daughters of Abraham. And that's the point that we're going to make here. Jeff read Romans chapter 9, verses 6 to 9, and I want to read that again for you. Just as a reminder of what he read and what the point is. In Romans chapter 9, starting verse 6, Paul writes this. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all, listen to this, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Now, Paul is writing about the Jews. And he says, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. And you look at that and say, what the heck is he talking about? Well, he explains. Not because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. They're descendants, but they're not children of God. On the contrary, and here's the key, on the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by the physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. You know, I don't know about you, but when I was reading this story, I, I asked Debbie this. I said, was the birth of Isaac a miracle? You know, like, like Jesus was a miracle. I mean, he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. And so you're thinking, well, is it a miracle? I mean, I guess, I guess it, it, it is in, in a sense. I mean, when you, read, when you read the scriptures, technically speaking, without getting too detailed, um, Isaac was conceived in the regular old-fashioned way. But a hundred-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman generally aren't producing babies. So Debbie said, yeah, I, I think it's a miracle. I guess I'll leave it at a miracle. Of course, physically speaking, it's an impossibility. The text makes a point, and this is interesting. The text makes a point that Isaac was born at the very time that God had promised. Isaac was born at the very time that God had promised. And it reminds us then of what Paul wrote in Galatians 4.4 when he talked about the timing of Jesus' birth. And he says this, when the time had fully come. You remember when he talked about the birth of Jesus? When, when, when Paul was writing that, he said that the time had fully come. And what he meant by that was every piece that needed to come together for the inauguration of the birth of Jesus was there. It was the right time in history, and, we, and Jesus was born. Same thing here. It was the right time in history. And it's a confirmation, and particularly when we speak of Isaac, it's a confirmation that God never fails in what he promises. God never fails in what he promises. Even though, even though it took 25 years, God never fails. And so when Isaac is born... They name him, I mean, they, they, they have him here and they, 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 they circumcise him after eight days. And it says in the text that his name means laughter. Let me read the first several verses. It said, now when the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah, for Sarah what he had promised, Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abram in his old age. At the very time that God had promised him. 
Now that was God's timing. It wasn't Abraham's timing. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son was born, when Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have bore him a son in his old age. Um, Isaac's name means laughter. And so Sarah here is playing on the word, the name Isaac, when she says everyone who hears about this will laugh with me because God brought me laughter. God brought me Isaac. You know, when it comes to promises, we can be confident God always keeps his promise. God always keeps his promise. Now, for Abraham, this happened 25 years ago. In Genesis chapter 12, when he was still Abram, when he had left his area, Hera, God had promised him that he was going to have nations. You know, like, like the stars in the sky, the, the, the sand in the seashore. It took 25 years. And it wasn't without some difficulties because within those 25 years, you know, they disbelieved God. And he has Ishmael, a son of the flesh, not a son of the promise, not a son of the faith. All the way back in Genesis 3.15, we see a promise from God. After Adam and Eve sinned, and we know that as the fall, God says this. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God is speaking to Satan, the serpent, serpent saying that I'm going to bring a savior. All the way back in Genesis 3.15, God promised that. And indeed, we have a savior and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. God promised the birth of Jesus in Isaiah 7.14 as to his promise. And this is a, a verse that we all know well in regard to Emmanuel. He said, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. God promised a son, a savior, and he's come through. God promises eternal life. God promises eternal life to all those who will turn to him and confess his name. In Romans chapter 10, in Romans chapter 10, the instruction, the promise of God for us is that we would believe. Listen to this in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If you declare your mouth with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And so the point here is Isaac was a son of promise. Isaac was also the son of faith, not flesh like Ismael. And God always comes through with his promises. We can look at a number of of Old Testament prophecies regarding the coming of Christ Jesus. And what happened? Christ came, as promised. And when we look at what God says in regard to our own need, when it says, if, if you confess the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, on that promise, on that promise, you will be saved. On that promise, you will be saved. I like this verse, Numbers 29, 19. I'll read it to you. It says, God is not human, that he should lie. He's not a human being, that he should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? And the answer to that is no. The answer is no. What he promises, he comes through with. God promised Abraham and Sarah a son. And that son was Isaac. But what about Ishmael? There's, there's the rest of the chapter. What about Ishmael? So we had Isaac, the child of, of faith, was born 
Now we come to Ishmael, the child of flesh, is banished. Let me read verses 8 to 20 in regard to Ishmael. The child grew and was weaned, speaking of Isaac. And on the day that Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had bore to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distrusted Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulder and he sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered into the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from the heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes. And she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. And while he was living in the desert of Param, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. When you read that account and, 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 and you hear that, that Sarah says, get rid of that, get rid of that guy, get, get rid of Ishmael, get rid of his mother, I no longer want them around here. They have no part. They have no part in, in this inheritance. I mean, when you first read that, you're like, wow, what a, what a mean spirit woman. What an awful thing to say. Kicking out, kicking out this, this slave woman and her, and her young teenage son. But what's interesting in the text is that God assures Abraham that what she said was the right thing. When she said that he will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. Because that's exactly right. God takes care of Ishmael. But Ishmael was not part of the inheritance of Isaac. Only Isaac was the son of the, of the faith versus Ishmael, the son of the flesh. Now, I'm not certain Sarah understood the ramifications of what she demanded, but it was prophetic and it was necessary. It was, in fact, God's plan to emphasize the role of faith and works and grace and law between Christ followers and law keepers. This, get, this gets kind of played out in the New Testament. Because when you think, of, when you think about Isaac and Ishmael, when you think about the promise that God had, Ishmael, Ishmael was not the promise for God. Ishmael was the result of disobedience. Ishmael was the result of Abraham and Sarah disbelieving God. He was the result of them not reckoning the promise of God, not waiting on God, but moving ahead and taking matters in their own hands. And that's why there is this distinction with between Isaac, the child of faith, versus Ishmael, the child of works, the child of flesh. And because of that, Ishmael was set aside. He became a great nation as God had promised, but he never, ever had any part to do with the inheritance that could be found only in the line of Isaac through Abraham. And that's where we are today. That's exactly where we are today. While Ishmael was indeed Abraham's son, he was the son of flesh. 
not the son of faith. You have people today who love church, and that's a good thing. And they love the fellowship, and that's a great thing. They love observing religious duties and, and making sure that, you know, they, they do the right thing. But, but many of these people have never come to a saving faith in Christ Jesus. All of what they have accumulated in regard to, I'll say, religion is all based on works, not on faith. And all of what they're doing, and they're doing it in a, in a sense of wanting to please God, it's just flesh. It accounts for nothing. It absolutely accounts for nothing. I've told you before that I was raised Roman Catholic. And those of you who know the Catholic faith, um, it's, it's, it's essentially a faith of works. Now, they believe that Jesus died on the cross and paid the debt of the sins, and, but it's not enough. It's not enough. It isn't as if being raised a Catholic, I could just say that I know the Lord Jesus is my Savior and I'm saved. No, that's not enough. That was considered the sin of presumption that I would that I would say that I would say that I know I saved and go into heaven. Because there were things I needed to do. I needed to go to mass. I needed to take the sacraments. I needed to be baptized. I needed to go to confession. I needed to do this. I needed to do that. They were all works that were meant to assure one's salvation in the Catholic faith, but it had nothing to do with being saved. It had nothing to do with being saved. Ishmael was the child of the flesh. Ishmael was conceived because of doubt concerning God's promise, not faith in God's promise. Jesus has an interesting discussion in John chapter 8. Take your Bibles there and turn to it. Jesus lays these things out for the Pharisees in regard to Abraham and who belongs to Abraham. In chapter 8, looking at verses 34 through 41. Jesus says this. John chapter 8, starting in verse 34. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me, because you have no room for my word. I am telling you that I have seen in the, Father, I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you heard from your father. And they answered, they answered Jesus, Abraham is our father, they answered. And Jesus says this, if you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God, Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. Then they say, we are not illegitimate children. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. Now here is, here is Jesus, and, and, and to get the picture, he's speaking to Pharisees, and a Pharisee loved God's word. A Pharisee did everything that they thought they could possibly do to honor God. They did all the works that were necessary. They did all the showy things, you know, you know wore the head things and the things from the robes and, and made sure they fasted and made sure they tied, all these things. But God knew, God knew that despite how religious they were, despite all the trappings that they had, they didn't know God. They were not children of Abraham. God calls them descendants, descendants, but not children, not children. That's where we need to be careful. That's where we need to be careful in regard to who we are in Christ. Galatians 3.29 says this, if you belong to Christ, 
then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. It's a matter of faith, not of flesh. The promise of a child to Abraham and Sarah was more than just a promise of fruitfulness and continuance of the seed. The account of God promising Abraham a son is many faceted. It's an act of simple faith. They believed, although they struggled in their belief. They, 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 they went ahead and had Ishmael because somehow what God had promised them couldn't come soon enough. So they thought that they would help God along by having a son, and that was wrong. That was a son of works. That was a son of flesh. That was not the son of promise. But the birth of Isaac was also promise of generations of future children of Abraham by faith. Us. Us. That's what makes this story so amazing. This isn't just a story in the Old Testament about, about an old couple having a son because God promised. That son Isaac made the separation between faith and flesh, between grace and works. And has given us then the direction as to, to whom we belong and how. Every one of us here. Let me read Galatians chapter 3, 26 to 29. This is what makes this story so amazing. When you bring it together with all the other things that God has spoken. In Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. All right? For all of you who are baptized in Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And here's the distinction. Here's the distinction that Paul makes. And this is the difference that makes a difference in Christianity. Because it has nothing to do with your nation. It has nothing to do with ethnicity. It has nothing to do with where you came from. It has everything to do with Christ. Paul says this. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So God's promise to Abraham and Sarah is a promise to us. Ishmael was circumcised according to the requirements of the law, but he was rejected as Abraham's heir. He was not a son of promise by faith. He was son of works and of the flesh. So you have all these righteous Pharisees and religious leaders in Jesus. They took great pride in being descendants of Abraham. What did God said? He said, you are the children of your father. And who was their father? Satan, the devil, the devil. Now, I'm not suggesting that when you go out for evangelism, that that's the first thing you tell somebody. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Well, no, I don't. Well, then you're a child of the devil. I wouldn't suggest saying that. But it's true. It's true. And, 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 and when we think of that, uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't revel in the fact that by faith we're, we're children of God, that's a great thing, but it also impact us then as to telling others about Christ Jesus, helping them to understand what it means to know and love Jesus. So let me bring this eternal truth to the here and now. Having heard all this, having heard about the difference between Isaac, the son of faith, and Ishmael, the son of flesh, understanding that, that the birth of Ishmael was actually a work of disbelief against God. Seeing here in regard to how you ought to live, seeing how, how Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for, 
for being so religious, but not knowing God, not knowing the Father that they claimed to believe in, understanding that they weren't descendants of Abraham. Where does that all, where does that all leave you? Because it's possible. It's possible today, right now, somebody is here thinking, you know, I love coming to church. And you know what? I, I love reading the Bible and, and, and I love doing religious things and I, and I love not doing this. And, and I certainly wouldn't do that. There may be some of you here that are counting on works. Well, you might not think they're works. I mean, you might say, well, aren't they good things? Yes, in and of themselves, yes, indeed, they're good things. We should be careful about where we go, what we watch, what we say. We ought to be reading the Bible. We ought to be keeping our, our testimony clear. But if it's, if it's not based on saving faith in Jesus Christ alone, it's works. It's a matter of your flesh and not of faith. Our salvation is not found in performance. It's found in a person, Jesus Christ. One divine, one holy person, Christ Jesus. And so if you're not sure of your own eternal life, I'd encourage you today, I'd encourage you today to examine your hearts and ask yourself, what am I trusting for my eternal life? How would I answer the question of whether or not I have any confidence about heaven? And if I have confidence in heaven, is my confidence in how I live or what I do or don't do? Or is my confidence in the blood of Jesus Christ that was, that was shed on the cross of Calvary? That's what we need to ask ourselves. It's always good, not in a doubtful way, not to make you doubt about your faith, but it's always good kind of to like check our hearts, check our hearts to, to understand that our, our salvation has nothing to do with performance. Oh, when you're saved, you want to please God. You want to do things that please God, but you know that those things are motivated by your faith. It's what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verses uh, 8, 9, and 10, when he talks about, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. And it says that we are ordained then, ordained then unto good works, which God had ordained beforehand that we should walk in them. So it's faith then works. So my encouragement to every one of us is let's be sure of our standing with God. Let's understand that Isaac was a promise of God, and he represents faith. He represents faith. Knowing that Ishmael was disobedience against God, and he represented flesh, no faith. God has shown us clearly that we are to trust Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and that we then become children of Abraham through faith in Christ Jesus. Again, Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's a promise. Let's pray.